evening. Welcome to our final program of the Winchester Academy Winter Spring 2021 series. My name is Julie Iden and I'm a trustee of the Winchester Academy. We'd like to take a moment to thank the city of Wapaka and our producer Josh Werner. Josh, thank you, Josh. Testing. Good evening. Welcome to our final program of Winchester Academy's Winter Spring 2021 series. My name is Julie Iden, and I am a trustee of Winchester Academy. We'd like to take a moment to thank the city of Wapaka and our producer, Josh Werner. Thank you, Josh, for providing the space and technology to bring this program to you virtually. Our next program, which will be the first program of our summer series, will be on Monday, June 7th. Tracy Hames will be giving a talk on Wisconsin wetlands. Tonight's program is sponsored by T-Dubs Pub. Thank you, T-Dubs. <laughs> we will have a question and answer session following Hannah's presentation tonight. Questions may be submitted via Facebook Live or by telephone. You can take note of the number and call at any time and the questions will be answered at the end. Our number is 715-942-9917. Our speaker tonight is Hanna Butkiewicz. Hanna is a Wapaka High School graduate. She earned her BS in Forest and Wildlife Ecology excuse me, from UW-Madison in 2016 and is currently working towards a master's degree in wildlife from UW-Stevens Point. Hannah, excuse me, Hannah recently accepted a position as the Executive Director of Golden Sands Resource and Development Council Incorporated. Hannah has participated in research on carner blue butterflies, migratory songbirds, freshwater mussels, fish, turtles, wild turkeys, and wolves. In her free time, she loves exploring the outdoors with her husband and her three dogs. And we'll take it to Hannah. Okay, welcome everybody to tonight's presentation. My name is Hannah Butkevich, and uh, thank you Winchester Academy for allowing me this opportunity to present on my research that I conducted during the summer of 2019 and 2020 on the summer diets of wolves in the central forests of Wisconsin. So I wanted to take the opportunity to also explain a little bit of myself before we get into the actual little elaboration on my introduction. So um, as I am a Wapaka alumni, so it's really a great as an alumni. I did receive my bachelor's degree from Wisconsin-Madison in forest and wildlife ecology. I am a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point, and actually my Graduate research is on wild turkeys, and I'm looking at productivity and recruitment, so the number of young turkeys in the state utilizing uh, Snapshot Wisconsin trail camera images. And Snapshot Wisconsin is a volunteer or citizen science program. And in addition to all of my education, I am also the new executive director for the regional conservation nonprofit called Golden Sands Resource Conservation. Regional conservation nonprofit that serves 13 different counties in the central Wisconsin area, and we, do we switch out mics. Oh, momentary pause.
Okay, how is this sounding? Okay, so we are uh, Golden Sands Resource Conservation and Development Council is a regional conservation nonprofit that serves 13 different counties in central Wisconsin. And our conservation services relate to four main pillars, which are uh, sustainable agriculture, clean water, abundant wildlife, and healthy forests. So if you're interested in conservation work, please reach out to me um, if you had any questions. But now, for what you've all been waiting for, the presentation on the summer diets of wolves in the central forest of Wisconsin. So I wanted to start out this presentation with a brief introduction on wolves and it's the history of wolves in Wisconsin. And wolves are large carnivores. They are an apex predator and their role on the landscape is to help with regulation of prey populations. And while this is great in the ecological sense, um, it provides a source of competition with, um, with hunters for white-tailed deer. And this was the case and this co contention um, between large carnivores and early European settlers in the 1800s um, resulted in a lot of negative perspectives of wolves in Wisconsin. And this resulted in bounties being placed on wolves in Wisconsin between uh, 18, from the 1860s through 1950s. And as a result of these bounties, if you want to think of a bounty similar to if you've seen old Western films, it's like <laughs> turn in this criminal for a certain payout. And this was the case for wolves in Wisconsin. So people were paid to remove adult wolves and also pups for a monetary reward. And unfortunately, because of this unregulation of take of wolves from Wisconsin's population, it resulted in the extirpation of wolves from Wisconsin by the 1960s. Um, fortunately, with the passing of the, um, the Endangered Species Act, wolf populations uh, were able to recover. Although they weren't in Wisconsin at this time, the states around Wisconsin's wolf populations were protected and were able to increase in size. And um, what ended up happening is because of the wolves' populations increasing um, in the Minnesota region, they were able to recolonize and naturally move into Wisconsin along the Minnesota border. And actually the first, um, the first county that had a pack recognized was in Douglas County. And as they began to recolonize Wisconsin, they ended up having, um, being designated as a state endangered species in 1975. And I do want to emphasize that this recolonization is a natural movement of wolves from the Minnesota region into Wisconsin, and it's not a reintroduction. And this is a misconception that's out there, that wolves were reintroduced, which implies that wolves were taken from a wild area by people and relocated to a new area and release. And that's not the case. This was all, all naturally occurring. Um, and as wolves moved into the state, there was a lot of interest, regardless of perspective, whether people were very po had very positive views about wolves in Wisconsin or if they, they felt fearful or had negative perspectives about them. And because of this, wolves were intensely um, monitored. They wanted to know where populations were, what the population size was at, how many packs are you know, in general areas. And so that's a, it's really neat that there was this monitoring effort. So this first, um, this first figure that I wanted to share with you it displays the number of wolves in this general increase over the years in Wisconsin. And then there is the blue line, the blue trend line is the number of packs that are, um, are in Wisconsin. And the beginning date, or the beginning year is 1980 through 2020. And the different colors, if you can see this on your screen, um, relate to the status, whether wolves were endangered, or, um, federally listed as endangered species, threatened, or, or whether they didn't have any listing, whether they were delisted. And what you'll see is on um, the figure, there's a large green um, strip from 2012 through 2014. And this um, delisting of the wolves also coincided with a big drop in the wolf population in the state. And that was because there was a, a wolf harvest during that time frame. 
And the most recent delisting of wolves actually occurred in the beginning of this year. And this also resulted in another wolf harvest. So it'll be interesting to see what figures kind of produced by the Department of Natural Resources taking into account the number of wolves that were harvested um, during this most recent wolf harvest. This next figure that I have up here, um, again, shows the trend line, the, the population increase over the years. But I really wanted to share this map uh, which shows the general progression of wolves in Wisconsin. So you can see it, that in 1980, it really started out in the northwestern part of the state, and then they were able to move eastwards and um, into the southern parts. And, and for my project and my study that I did, um, it was in the central forest, so in this kind of um, isolated patch <laughs> in the lower part of, of their, their range. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, wolves have been intensely monitored since they've returned to Wisconsin. And some of the methods for monitoring wolves, um, it really depends on actually the research objectives. But uh, some of the typ typical um, methods for monitoring wolves include using radio collars and GPS collars. Um, and doing tracking surveys where you go out into the, in the winter into a wolf territory and you're looking for tracks that were left behind um, moving wolves. Um, and then also you can conduct howling surveys. But as you'll learn through the, by the end of this presentation, there are other methods for monitoring, monitoring wolves. <clears throat> so I've got a couple people here in the audience. And for some of you, you already know, based on last week's presentation, maybe what I'm, I'm alluding to. But for those of you who don't know, please feel free to answer and respond. I wanted to get a little bit of audience interaction right away. So uh, looking at the, this wolf, this picture of a wolf, if you were presented with um, this question of what wolves are eating in the central forests of Wisconsin, what might you think to do in order to understand what they are eating. And maybe, maybe you all know what I'm going to get at. <laughs> OK, so for those of you who don't know what I'm alluding to, I really see there being like three different ways to understand what wolves are eating. This first one um, is to actually observe wolves physically consuming um, their prey. So what this would require is for you to likely have um, GPS collars on wolves and you would have to encounter them at a moment that they were eating and likely your, your presence would end up interrupting their behavior. And this would, um, this would be a really challenging way to move forward with understanding summer diets because of the expense. Um, and if you didn't have radio collars, there's <laughs> the likelihood of you actually opportunistically running into a wolf one is the probability is really low. And the probability that you would run into a wolf that's also consuming something is also even lower. So you're, just, you're out of luck there if you don't have expensive equipment or a captive population. The second way would be to look at carcasses and the remains of, of kills. And, and this, study, this kind of a study has been done in the past where um, researchers have had radio collars or GPS collars on wolves and they track and monitor the wolf movement and in times when the wolves are, um, are resting in an area, they're not moving very far from an area, it's an indication that they've likely killed an animal and they are eating it and kind of lounging in the area. They're staying quite close to, to their kill site. And if you've got a, a wolf collared, you're able to see this behavior, know what the GPS location is of that activity, and then in order to figure out what they were actually consuming, it requires a lot of time and energy to trek out to that site and then put on your FBI hat and figure out on where is the carcass <laughs> and, and what is it. And in some cases, the, the species that wolves are, are consuming are actually the, the entire body is consumed because there are a lot of nutrients that or calcium is in the bone, so it's good for them to eat every, every bit. And when you are a wolf and you rely on the consumption of other species in order to meet your energetic demands, you're going to eat what you can. <laughs> and the third 
Um, the third opportunity for like method for understanding what wolves are eating is through the use of scat. And this is near and dear to my heart because this is what I utilize for studying um, the summer diets of wolves. And you'll recognize that you just have to have a sense of humor when you are dealing with poop. And if you are uncomfortable by the, the, the word poop or scat or feces or whatever your choice word is, maybe this presentation isn't for you because if, if this bothers you, then the rest of my presentation, it's all downhill from, it's all downhill from here. But the really neat thing about using SCAT for studying the summer diets of wolves, or just wolf diets in general, is that um, you know, based on our own experience, what you eat is, comes in, it's digested, and then it's excreted. And in the case of wolves, this is the same thing, but as we've all experienced probably, not everything that you consume is equally digested or digested at all upon excretion. And this is the case with wolf scat and the two different things that, there are a couple of things that aren't actually digested when they are consumed. And the two things that I was mainly interested in were both the hair and bones um, within scat. And the hair of the prey item that's consumed is the best indication of what they're actually eating. And this, this figure that you'll, or this picture that you'll see on the screen indicates this. I've got um, hair, uh, this is a wolf scat, and I've got hair in the little circular box, or circular box, that doesn't make any sense, in the box with rounded edges. And then I've got an arrow pointing to um, to some bony material. And some of these bone shards are quite sharp and quite long, and it's a wonder that they are actually passed through the system without injury. Okay, before I proceed, I want to give you a full disclaimer that um, you should proceed with your own, at your own discretion with um, your attention to this presentation. This presentation is not for the weak stomach. As I alluded to earlier, if you're uncomfortable with certain phrases or the topic of feces, um, this presentation might not be for you. So the exit is over there for anybody who's too uncomfortable. <laughs> No, you don't have to smell it. That is, that is the wonderful thing. I already did all of that work for you. <laughs> okay, so my research objectives were to understand what wolves were eating in the central forest of Wisconsin utilizing scat. And I was interested in seeing how the diet changed over the course of the summer between different months and also between different packs. I was uh, looking at uh, four different pack territories and um, looking at their diets um, throughout the summers of 2019 and 2020. So you can also see the variation between, um, I was interested in the variation between years too. <clears throat> so one of the reasons why I was particularly interested in conducting this research was one, I was um, approached by some members of the Timberwolf Information Network uh, who said, hey Hannah, we know you're a you're, you're a graduate from UW-Madison and you're looking for some research and we've got the perfect opportunity for you. Hope you don't mind dealing with SCAT. The other reason why this was an interesting project is that the, the last time that research has been done in Wisconsin related to SCAT and thinking about what wolves are eating wasn't done uh, or was done back in the mid-1900s or 1950, yeah, 1950s time period. And, and it was conducted in the, north, the northern part of the state. And so my research was in the, south, the central, central forest of Wisconsin and is in present day. So it's, it's an, a recent study. And um, so that was one reason. And then also the other neat thing about this project and my motivation was, was research that was being done um, by Voyagers, um, the Voyagers Wolf the Wolf Project in Voyagers National Park. And they were looking at, they had conducted their own research on the summer diets of wolves in Voyagers National Park. And they created this neat, um, anim this neat graphic, which is just a screenshot of an animation I'll show you. But, but essentially they were able to figure out what the percent composition of these four um, wolf packs and also at the population level were consuming. Um, so we've got adult deer, deer fawn, beaver, berries, snowshoe hare, 
and moose. And the interesting thing, like if you think about comparing Voyagers National Park, which is up in the northern part of Minnesota compared to the Central Forest, we already don't have certain food items that are going to be available. So I already was cued into, okay, there's going to be some, some difference. And what that difference is, I'm not really sure, but let's find out. So I wanted to share with you um, what this animation looks like. you can all see that. Is it coming through? Oh. Yeah, you'll have to click there. But it should be showing uh, broadcasting with Facebook Live. But anyways, it shows that um, you'll see with the deer fawn how there's this peak in a between like April and May. Um, there's also a peak earlier in the season with beaver. And after fawns end up developing some ability to evade predators, um, their numbers and percent composition goes down and then you see, um, and that's when food is scarce on the landscape and that's when you see this increase in actually berry, berries being consumed. So that's a neat little thing. So if you're interested in wolves, you might want to take an extra look at um, the Voyagers National Park stuff. Okay, so the image that you'll see um, here is of, of the study site in the four different pack territories that I was working within. Um, in order to study the summer diets of wolves, I selected four pack territories. I collected scat on a weekly basis, May, th um, May through August. I drove 120 miles um, each week looking for scat and picking it up opportunistically along roads, like on the roadway and the road edges. And what was nice and really helpful in finding the scat was that the majority of the roads that I was driving were um, forest roads in the, the Nacida National Wildlife Refuge or the um, Meadow Valley Wildlife Management Area. Um, they weren't paved roads, so I was able to use the fact that it was a substrate and it wasn't darkly colored in order to see this contrast between um, roadway and then scat. And in order to find the scat, I had to drive 25 miles an hour to efficiently um, scan the roadways. And so each of these scat collection days, it took me about six and a half hours of driving in, throughout the study area collecting scat. So as I mentioned, I was looking for this color change between what was the road surface was and actually the scat. And the two images that are on the, um, the slide now, the one on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you can see that there's some type of a blip in the distance. Now, while these aren't actually scat, this is the kind of stuff that I was queuing into. Actually, the left-hand picture is of a porcupine in the distance, and the right-hand one was a mega snapping turtle that I came across while, while studying them. But, but this, is the, this is the thing. I was looking for anything that looked like a lump in the roadway. And oftentimes, it was scat, but I occasionally was tricked by pieces of wood <laughs> or pieces of plastic or the occasional on some of those paved roads. It was tar that <laughs> tripped me up. But over the course of two summers, I developed a certain type of detector. I won't say what, but a detector of some sort. This is a funny image I had. Um, this next slide is a funny image that I have received from Ray Leonard, uh, who's the president of the Timberwolf Information Network. And he had sent me a text saying, Hana, I found the longest scat, wolf scat I've ever seen. And upon first opening up the image, I was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is, this is a big one. And then upon further inspection, it was just a stick. But, but this is the kind of stuff that you get actively tripped up on. But it's, again, that sense of humor that keeps you, that keeps you going. So in addition to looking for, for color variation between um, the road and the scat on the road, I also learned to cue into and utilize butterflies and um, flies and dragonflies as a detection method for finding the scat. Because when scat is deposited, um, there's a lot of moisture that's on it, and then there's also nutrients and minerals. And so the butterflies and these other insects are very drawn to it. So as I'm driving around, if I saw butterflies flush up from an area and then there was this, you know, 
sizable mass in <laughs> the roadway, I would be cued in to know, okay, let's go check it out for further investigation. So I really, it was just a little, a little trick that I, I learned. So here's wonderful picture number one. Um, this is an example of one of the wolf scats that I found. And yes, it is disgusting. <laughs> and here's another image of um, an example of a scat that I, that I collected um, this last summer. And then here is another um, mega pile of wolf scat. And if you're wondering why I've got so many images, one, I want to bring you into the world of and the a daily life of, of a researcher, but two, I'd also heard from somebody that there weren't enough sample pictures in the last presentation, so I wanted to make sure to overload you with, with plenty of pictures of wolf scat. <laughs> So one, in addition to, to scat being neat in the fact that hair and bone are not digested, um, looking at scat, you're able to actually kind of tell what, what process or um, what stage of consumption of a kill wolves are in. So when wolves kill, let's say like a white-tailed deer, and they're going to focus initially on the, um, those vital organs because they're high in nutrients, high in protein. And as a result, it, depending on what they're eating uh, um, affects what comes out the other end. So their first step is to go through for those vital organs. Then they work on more of the skeletal muscle. And then they'll go to the bone. And then the hide is left for the last if, if they don't have another kill that they've made since then. So as a result of eating these, this initial high, high protein and uh, nutrient-rich organs, they end up with very loose stool, as you can see with this image. And for the scientific term, this is a greaser or a pudding scat. <laughs> Gross, yes. <laughs> this was, I have to thank Ray for a lot of these, these pictures that I have, in addition to my own. So this is a greaser pudding scat. This is that first scat. So it's an indication that there is a fresh kill likely around that area. Um, this image, which you saw earlier, is likely from something that, where they were consuming more of the, the muscle. And then this third image is of, of a, what I call the calcium scat. This is more of a bony scat. And because there's so much calcium in it, it's actually a very, a very hard and solid scat. And the final, um, final stage is the consumption of most of the hair with the hide. And that's an, this image here. <clears throat> so in addition to having this struggle of trying to figure out what, where scat was on the roadways and which roads to drive, I also had to worry about differentiating between other species that might have defecated on these roadways. And the, the two other species that I would have to be cognizant about are um, bears, black bears, and then also coyotes. And the difference between um, black bears and wolves, or black bears have have very, they have very large scats that they produce. They are kind of like an elephant dropping compared to, um, compared to a wolf scat. And, and so that's the big, big thing is this just massive dumping, <laughs> massive round um, uh, fecal deposit compared to a wolf scat. But then between the two canids, the wolves and the coyotes, they generally have this, this tapered end, as you can see with um, the, the two images on the screen. But the difference between um, wolves and coyotes is that wolves, just in general, are bigger animals than coyotes, and so they produce one just a larger scat than coyote. But then the, there's also a difference in the diameter of the feces that's produced. So for my research, I used a calipers in order to measure the difference in the diameter between, of the scat. So anything that was greater than 25 millimeters was labeled as a wolf scat, and anything that was less I, I did collect things that were less than that, but I, it was a small, smaller canid. It could have been a small wolf scat because we all know that, you know, depending on what you eat, you can have variable, um, uh, variable uh, feces size. But um, yeah, so it was. It could have been a, a, a smaller wolf scat, or it could have been a coyote scat. But as long as I kept above the 25 millimeter mark, that, that was my indication that I actually had a wolf scat. Okay, so whenever I found a, a, 
a piece of scat on the roadways, my, my first step was to one, look at the macro appearance of, of the scat and to differentiate between whether or not I had a bear, a coyote, or a wolf scat. And then I would um, also take the measurement as a diameter and then take a GPS coordinate because I was interested to know where the scat was deposited across the four different pack territories. And then I would grab my handy dandy Ziploc, very expensive Ziploc bags, uh, write down a, a uniquely, I, unique ID number on the bag and then pick up the, pick up the scat. The scat would then go in the back of my car into a box or into an, uh, an old igloo cooler and by the end of the sm summer, it was hanging out of my car in a reusable Aldi <laughs> grocery bag. So a lesson, I have a couple of key takeaways listed in this presentation. Again, humor is important to research and important especially when you're doing research on scat. Key takeaway number one is if you own a dog, you are qualified to pick up wolf scat. So don't hesitate. If you are a dog owner, add this to your resume. You are a professional wolf scat picker up or you are just waiting for your opportunity. Number two is if I ever offer you a used cooler, please kindly decline. <laughs> you don't want that. So after a number of uh, scat collection days, it was usually after I had about 80 scats collected, I'd have what we called scat days at the Wapaka Biological Field Station. So I should actually first mention that after I would have a scat collection, I would take the freshly collected scat and then store it in a freezer um, in order to to collect a, a certain number before I had these scat days because I would um, utilize the Wapaka Biological Field Station's interns to help me with the further processing of the scat. Essentially, we were, our goal with these scat days was to wash away the fecal matter from the hair and bone of each of these scats in order to get a better idea or visual of, of the hair and bones that were contained. And so here's an image from um, the first summer, as you can see, Acadia on the far left is not too pleased <laughs> with her, her scat sausage links. And yes, those are women's nylon pantyhose. <laughs> so the first step in this processing of wolf scat in order to clean it uh, involves stuffing um, frozen wolf feces into nylon stockings. With each scat that went into the nylon stocking, so too did, uh, went a, an individually identified um, livestock tag. So we had different colors and different numbers so that we could tell when a wolf scat came out of the washing process what, what um, scat it was related to and then also what GPS location it, was, um, it corresponded with. And after each frozen scat went in, we'd also tie it, tie a knot at the top so that we would have the separation between different samples. And actually, we had to go through, as you saw with that very, with the second image of wolf scat, that you can have some of these uh, large and sharp bone shards. So it was important for us to um, double stuff the, the wolf scat. So we took the, the one leg that was stuffed with wolf scat and, and stuffed it again into the other um, unused nylon leg. And this was uh, important because I didn't want to lose, I didn't want samples to mix with one another and I didn't want samples to potentially mix with um, or be lost to, during this laundering process. So after, after going through the labor of stuffing the nylon scats or the nylons with scats and making our scat sausage links, it was time to boil. And as you know from last week's presentation, Letty uh, studied the parasites of, of the wolf scats and the canid scats that I had collected in the central forest of Wisconsin. And before I would go through any of this, it was important for her to be able to take her samples because she wanted to have the samples fresh before they went through this boiling process because the boiling process, was in, the intention was to kill any of the parasites that might be in there that could potentially um, you know, uh, endanger those of us that were working with the scats. Um, and as Anne said, as long as we don't have to smell anything, we're all good. One of the things that I learned quickly during the summer was to make sure that I was always up <laughs> on the upper side of the wind. I didn't want to be downwind from, from the, this turkey fryer. 
during the boiling. And so boiling lasted 30, or it was done for 45 minutes in order to appropriately and adequately kill the parasite. So key takeaway number three for tonight is if I offer you a turkey fryer, please, again, kindly decline. Tell me no. So I do have a couple of quotes from the summer research with these scat days from both Ray Leonard, again, the president of the Timberwolf Information Network, and then Bob Welch, who is part of the Wapaco Biological Field Station, and then myself. So the first one is from Ray. He said, the smell was not as bad as he expected, but certainly memorable. It's hard to describe. It doesn't really smell like scat. Bob, <laughs> Bob thought it smelled like reconstituted venison. And if you know Bob, that is exactly what he would think. <laughs> Hi, Bob. I know you're listening in, so I hope you appreciate this. <laughs> and then um, for me, I just gagged. It was, it was a bit of a treacherous, <laughs> treacherous experience, but we went through the boiling process, and then it was time, time to take them out of the, the turkey fryer and then to pressure hose them off in order to completely or to further break apart the scat. As I mentioned with the calcium scat, some of them are quite, quite compact, and so it was important to spray them down, but then also to take a glove hand and to um, further help break down the process. Um, the another, another takeaway for tonight is that I'm a terrible cook. And don't, don't, don't sample my cooking. Go to my husband for the cooking. <laughs> um, and then once we went through the process of, of actually breaking up the scat with, with the pressure washer in our hands, then it went into a, a donated um, laund or a washing machine. And unfortunately, the washing machine did not have, did not have a wolf scat setting. <laughs> For me to use, but the the wolf scat bundles were went through two rinse to um, rinse to spin cycles in order to uh, we really relied on the agitation in the to remove the the fecal matter from from the hair and bones. And again, number five takeaway for the night is again kindly decline. <laughs> the funny thing about this washing machine was that it was donated from the Rathjen family, um, and this washing machine is actually older than I am, but it worked out for two summers, and so I couldn't have been more ha happy, um, especially as a researcher working with a limited or very tight budget. <laughs> After scat was washed, then it was time to open up these little um, bundles, these little presents, and um, take out the hair and bone and lay them out on, on paper plates. And, and this, was the, this was the fun part because the smell was... There wasn't a smell with this part, and, and it was really exciting because you never knew exactly what you were opening up. And looking at this plate on the right hand, I do have a clue with my little pointer, but does anybody have an idea of what kind of animal might have been consumed to produce this scat? So this scat was actually, uh, this came from a fawn. This was a fawn scat. And now what I have um, pointed and highlighted is actually part of a hoof. And this was an indication, one, the color of the hair and just the general characteristics of the hair, but then the, the presence of these little hooves that are quite um, malleable um, in, drew me into one knowing it was a deer and then also the age class as being a fawn. So on sunny days after washing, washing the scat, we'd let it air dry out on the lawn, and then it would go into the greenhouse at the Wapaka Biological Field Station in order to completely dry. And this drying process was necessary um, before we put it into plastic bags for storage, before we did further analysis, because if there was moisture that was contained when it was placed into a bag, you'd end up with mold growing, and then you could lose, lose your sample. Um, I did have a couple that had a little bit of mold, but fortunately it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough moisture to create a large enough mold invasion, um, and I, I didn't lose the samples, and I was able to appropriately identify the species that had produced, produced the scat. <clears throat> Here are um, examples of that final stage of bagging them. And what I wanted to point out with in this lower right-hand corner um, picture is that one, 
there is a lot of hair that can be consumed to produce a scat. Like that, the plate is full and overflowing with, in this case, this was fawn scat. And then also, um, I'm not sure to what detail you're able to see on this screen, but, but there's also vegetation. There's grass that is part of, of the scat. And the grass is consumed, if you think about your dogs at home, if they've got an upset tummy, what do they do? They end up going towards the grass. And for wolves, they'll consume grass to help entangle and, and snarl the intestinal parasites, and it acts as a way to pull and draw them out of, of their intestines. And so this next image is just a, a, a a little collage of sorts of the scats. <laughs> Told you I'm not, I'm not failing to present on and share a number of images. But the neat thing is, is that after all this hard work, you can see that there's this difference between colors. There's this difference between the, the amount of hair that's contained within scats. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite neat. So I wanted to share some of the ones that I, I had taken pictures of each of the, the plates. So, um, the image that you see on the slide here is that of a, of a fawn uh, wolf scat. Again, um, you can see with the coloration of the hair. And then also, um, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner of this picture that, that there is a, another hoof, which would clue you into knowing that it's a, a fawn scat. Uh, this is from a muskrat. You can already tell from the difference in the, the general color, going from a brown, uh, the rusty brown to a gray. And then for this scat in particular, we had the benefit of having teeth that were part of, part of the scat, so that we were able to cue in on, on that. This one, we had blueberries. Um, there are a number of scats that actually had some berry seeds. Definitely not to the degree that the Voyagers National Park, uh, Voyagers Wolf Project had, but, but still present in an, a couple of samples. And then this image, just this next image shows how um, some of the scats just have a bunch of bone. So in addition to finding fawn and adult deer and muskrat and also the berries, um, some of the other main uh, Prey species ended up being uh, beaver. I saw some cottontail rabbit hair. Um, a number of, of scats had uh, raccoon, raccoon hair, and then um, a little bit of actually gray squirrel and, and bird feathers were included in it. And then, and then I've also got some other noteworthy finds to share with you too. Uh, in a couple of the scats, I found cherry pits, blueberries, um, as you saw in the previous image and some small berry seeds, maybe from some blackberries or raspberries. And then bird feathers. I found turtle skin and claws in one of the scats. It was quite, it was quite neat. At first, I was thinking I had um, skin from maybe a, a snake, but it was, too, it was too rough. And then, then I found claws <laughs> attached to it. And, um, not sure exactly what species it might have been. Um, but it was one of the larger ones. It could have been, I was thinking, maybe a blanding turtle from the area or maybe a, a smaller, snapping, uh, smaller snapping turtle. I found trail mix in one, and this likely was from a wolf that had found a bear bait pile in the area. I did find a number of scat with plastic in them, which is cause for concern. But wolves will, um, if they find something that smells good, they will... They will lick it as you would have a dog if you have a, you know, if you go to the butcher and you've got that wax paper that's got a certain smell, got a certain t residual taste, goes down the hatch. And um, so it could be from somebody's garbage, it could be from a landfill, it could be from something that was unfortunately tossed out of somebody's window that ended up in the belly of this, uh, these couple of wolf scat or wolves who who produced those scats, and I also found a shoelace. Unfortunately enough, there was no foot or no person that was attached to that, that shoelace. Uh, so once I was to the step where I had all of these processed scats, the next stage was to one look at the macroscopic um, characteristics of each scat, and then also to look at the microscope, uh, look underneath the microscope. And this uh, image shows on the left just the general plate of, of hair and bone remains, and then on the far right is 
actually a, um, a view of hair underneath the microscope. And this microscope was purchased by the Wapaka Biological Field Station um, with funds from the Deborah Ann Martin Scholarship. And the neat thing about the microscope is that you'll see that there's a tablet that's attached. And this allowed me to be able to take images of what I was looking at underneath the microscope. So it was quite neat. Um, so what I was looking for in general at the, um, the macro level is I was cueing into the color, the, pat the color pattern of hair. Some, some species have where they've got different dark or light, like variation between dark and light bands. And then also like the hooves and the, the bones helped help with identification. And I really focused in on, on the guard hairs, which are those sick, or the coarser hairs on the body versus the under fur, which is usually shorter. The guard hairs are more easily d distinguished between, between species compared to the under fur. And under fur is just quite a bit smaller too. Um, um, so yeah, the, the figure on the right is for the, the image that I would view underneath the microscope. And what I was cueing into when I was looking at the hairs underneath the microscope was there are a couple of features of hair. With a hair follicle, you have scales on the outer part of the hair follicle. And this differs between different species. And then there is a central part. So the scales are shown on the, the top part, the top figure here. And you can see there's a difference between coronal scales and imbricate scales. And then you've got variations with, within those. And then this bottom image shows the, differ, the differences between what's called the medulla, or the center of the hair follicle. So this was, this was my tool to, one, make sure I was training my eye looking at the macro level to knowing what I was actually seeing and <laughs> recognizing that my classification was correct. But then it was also if I was um, needing to look further for more information otherwise, it, or, and just for finding cool images and sharing on some neat, neat techniques. But um, it really helped out with some of the species that may have the same color kind of um, guard hairs and, and under fur, and if I had a trouble, had trouble with that macro level. Um, so the next slide is what a deer hair, an adult deer hair, looks like underneath the microscope. And what you'll see is what I call like corn cobbing scales. The scales are quite circular. And so this is a, um, a zoomed in image of a deer hair. And again, the image that you saw a couple slides ago um, this is it again and popped up, uh, uh, um, zoomed in, but this is also an image of some deer hair. The next slide is of beaver hair, and this really nicely demonstrates the, the medulla of the hair follicle. You'll see the, the central part, and that is characteristically different from um, that of a muskrat. And those two have similar looking guard hairs. Beaver hairs are quite, uh, they're coarser and they're actually longer. Um, and muskrats are actually shorter. But, but if you have something that's kind of in between and you're un, unsure, that when you look at it underneath the microscope, you'll be able to distinguish and differentiate between the two based on the medulla. And also beaver hair has this golden brown kind of image um, when you look at it underneath the microscope. And this next slide is of a, a muskrat hair. So, so looking at this, this hair and the medulla, the center versus this previous one, you can see that there's, there's a difference that you're able to draw in, in addition to being able to see this difference in like the, the general the general color. And you can see this image, it's, it's kind of tricky to be able to catch, capture a three-dimensional um, piece underneath the microscope because in order to see the medulla, you have to zoom into that layer. So you lose the ability to focus in on the scales. But, on the, um, but you can see, if you look closely, I know you're a little limited with what you're able to see off of the TV screen, but um, you can kind of see the pattern of the scales. Um, this is an image of, of raccoon hair. I was very excited to find raccoon hair because I wasn't expecting it, for one. And um, 
when I was doing the washing process, I was just thinking to myself, when I saw a couple of these scats, I was like, this has to be raccoon hair, but I, you know, this wasn't something that had been found in the Voyager's um, wolf project, and so it was kind of unique. Now, that wasn't like there were a bunch of scat samples with raccoon. It was likely an opportunistic take of a raccoon, or it could have been from um, something that might have been hit on the side of the road, but there are a lot of raccoons, and <laughs> if you've got the opportunity to take one in order to meet your energetic demands, then, then it makes sense. <clears throat> and then this last image of uh, a hair follicle is from a cottontail rabbit. Cottontail hair hair. <laughs> cottontail rabbit hair. <laughs> So this first figure that I have um, just shows and demonstrates the difference in the number of wolf scats that I found between the years of 2019 and 2020. Um, it's really interesting that I had such a difference and there was such a drop in 2020. And I'll get into this more with the discussion, but I, I am <laughs> guessing that it has a lot to do with the pandemic, actually. So <laughs> blame COVID when you <laughs> Whenever you can. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't blame COVID. But I, I do really think that I do really think that the pandemic influenced the number of scats that I collected this second summer field season. But it's also interesting to see that in 2019 there were more scats that were collected right away in the summer when it's cooler, and then it dropped off in July and August when it was you know, warmer, so you'd think, okay, they're going to be more active maybe um, during May and June versus July and August, but then there's a little bit of muddiness with, with the 2020. It seemed like there was less, um, less scat being deposited on the roadways in May and August, well, May just in general because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, May right away in the beginning, and then it increased, it peaked in June, and then it it tapered off, but I, I don't exactly know why the wolves weren't, weren't going on the roads and defecating, but I do have some suspicion that it is tied to the pandemic. Uh, this first um, pie chart shows the prey species that were identified and the wolf scats that were collected in the central forest um, in the, during the summer of 2019. And without a doubt, we are, this is kind of what I anticipated, is that the majority of the scats are from, from deer, the white-tailed deer. And um, the 6% that is in the gray is from beaver, and then the 3% in orange is from muskrat. And so the three, the three top species that were consumed during 2019 that ended up in my samples were white-tailed deer, beaver, and muskrat, and the other ones were to, um, th they were less than 2%. So uh, to let you know about some of these other numbers, or other labels up here, I had um, turtle, small mammal, some of them were unknown, where the hairs were all, you know, just completely damaged during the process of either um, digestion or, or from the washing process. Um, <clears throat> and I had bird, um, there was gray squirrel, and then there were some mixed scats. So you'll see where I've got like D comma B, that's a scat that was mixed between with both deer and beaver. So in addition to 77% being just single scats with a single prey species of white-tailed deer, there were also a number of scats that had a mixture of deer and a, another species. And then in 2020, things um, were modified slightly. We had an increase in the presence of white-tailed deer, 86%, and then the next highest was 7% being from muskrat. And beaver were kind of not in the picture um, in 2020, which is, is interesting, and I'm not sure quite why, but it's interesting that when the beaver, beaver dropped off in their diet, it was almost compensated for with muskrat. I do want to say that I have 25 scats that are still in the freezer, hopefully not freezer burn from the winter time, but um, that I still need to process yet this summer. So there, there could be some modifications to this, this um, figure here. But again, the same story and kind of our expectations were that deer, white-tailed deer are um, making up the majority of the diet. And I do also want to point out that just because once like a scat 
had deer in it. it. It's not equivalent. One scat does not mean that one deer was killed. There could be multiple, multiple productions of scat um, for an individual animal. And so here's a, um, the slides just shows the comparison between the 2019 and 2020. So again, you can see that um, that 6% is that gray pie slice for 2019 just vanished between, between 2019 and 2020, and then the amount of muskrat increased. <clears throat> and this was just an interesting figure I put together. During the second summer, I, I measured the diet. Well, I measured the diameter for both 2019 and 2020 seasons, but I actually re I recorded it during the 2020 season. And um, we had scats that ranged from 25 to 39 millimeters in size, and the, av the majority of the scats were between 25 to 31. <clears throat> oh, man. Do the math. <laughs> no pressure. Do the math up while you're presenting. <laughs> I'll have to um, after I, I get done pre presenting that. Is it close to one? No. Okay. I probably should know that, but catch me off guard. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about some of my reasoning for maybe why um, the why COVID-19 might have impacted the, the difference between samples collected in 2019 and 2020, um, and the, what I noticed during the field season of 2020 was that there was this significant increase in traffic while I was collecting scat. And so my thought is that with the increase in traffic from people being restricted with what they were able to do socially, they were wanting to get out into their cars, their UTVs or ATVs, and to drive around. In a, that was their way to, to pass time. And so more human disturbance in the area means that wolves are likely going to be um, reducing their, their use of the roadways or limiting their use to the road, of the roadways to specific times. But then also, because there was this increased amount of traffic, unfortunately, this means that there's an increased likelihood over, between the week, um, over the course of the week between my sampling dates when scat could have been squashed by um, a tire of a, of a vehicle of some sort, or that, um, so one squash, or it could have just been taken away and not even, so I wouldn't have any indication that there was even a scat that I could have, could have collected. So I, I'm thinking that the reason for this decrease had to deal with just this increase in activity, but I don't know how or whether it was disproportionate or, or proportionate across if the impact of this increased traffic was proportionate across each of these pack territories or not. Uh, the other discussion point that I wanted to bring up again is that deer do make up the majority of, of the diet of wolves based on, based on my research, but that muskrats and beaver were also present. It's interesting that um, with the Voyager's wolf project that they had beaver, but there weren't muskrats. And, and I don't know, um, I guess there's a little more research that I could do on my part to figure out, you know, if there's difference in habitat use between, between muskrats and beaver, if they have this, um, maybe they're competitive with one another. So if increased population of beaver means reduced population or availability for muskrat, um, it'll be interesting to look more into that. And then my final discussion point is that poo is cool. There's a lot to learn from looking at scat. <laughs> I love your facial expression, Sam. <laughs> but there's a lot to learn. And, um, and, and even though you're out looking for scat, there's still so much that you're able to learn about the study area as you're, as you're driving around. And I do have some um, neat pictures to share at the end of the presentation. So as far as the next steps for research, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not done yet. I still have a number of things to deal with, including um, finishing, I have to finish processing the remaining wolf scats. I need to complete statistical analysis. As you saw with my figures, I didn't actually go into, um, I didn't go into comparison, comparing between the different packed territories. And one of the difficulties here is that packed territories do overlap. And on one of the roadways that is in the study site is, is where they overlap. And there were a number of scat that was collected on this 
interface between the two, two territories. So I am, un, I, I am uncertain about whether to assign those scat to, you know, which pack to assign those scat to. So I need to complete the statistical analysis, and then I, um, my plans are to do um, to write a manuscript and get and hopefully be able to publish my results. But um, this will have to wait until I finish processing SCAT and do some statistical analysis, and also finish my graduate <laughs> my graduate research too, since this is this is a, an extra project that I took on. Um, so here are some picture some neat finds from from the study site. Um, so as I mentioned, while driving around, you get, you have the opportunity to learn way more than just scat. We've got uh, a hognose snake. I found blanding turtles all the time, painted turtles. And I also had the opportunity to do some tracking. So um, after the best tracking times are after um, rain falls, a couple days after rain falls, because you get these beautiful imprints of the paws. And so it's like, in addition to scat, knowing kind of a little bit about what the wolf was up to, um, the tracks give an indication of that too. And then on the bottom left, I've got coyote in the top center. I've got a wolf track. And in the bottom right, I had a black bear, black bear track. And if you are interested in learning more about wolves, I would strongly suggest you taking um, a look at both the Facebook and Twitter accounts for the Canid Howl Project. This is um, an inter international group of people who are interested in studying wolves through the use of audio recordings. And I actually participated in um, a project two summers ago, or two winters ago, in the general study area. So I was able to capture audio recordings of the wolves that I was collecting feces from. <laughs> so it was this extra, you know, relationship building between myself and those wolves. Um, the Voyager's Wolf Project, they're both active on Facebook and Twitter. I would also strongly suggest and encourage you all to consider joining the Timberwolf Information Network, um, TWIN, and getting involved in everything wolves. Um, they do tracking surveys in the winter, so that's neat to participate in. And they also host a number of winter wolf ecology workshops at various locations. And then um, also keep an eye out for the, uh, with the Natural Resource Foundation field trips. Um, before the pandemic had hit, um, we had planned to host a, a field trip in the study area to take people that were interested in this research out into the study area to look for tracks, to look for scat, and have a general wolf ecology um, discussion. Uh, I, do, I don't know how much time we have, but after the presentation, if you'd like, I can click on these different links. Uh, I've got, with the Canid Howl Project, there's a neat audio recording of the wolves howling with the Voyager's Wolf Project. Um, you'll have to, you'll really have to check them out. They just released a video where they had had a video recorder as part of a collar on a wolf. And so there's a, just over a two minute clip basically giving you the perspective of what it's like to be a wolf and walking in the shoes of a wolf. Um, and they did mention that the, the beard of the wolf, they learned that they needed to trim the beard for future times because <laughs> the hair from the, the neck covered up a little bit of the camera, but it's, it's really neat. So um, I would strongly suggest that. And then my final slide is just a, a general thank you slide, an acknowledgement. I want to give special thanks to the Wapaka Biological Field Station and the interns, um, the Timberwolf Information Network, to Bob Welch, to Ray Leonard, to Dick Thiel, Doug Merrickey, the Rathjen family, and then my furry companions who, um, who participated in this, in this research along, along my side. They kept me company while, while driving through the study area. So with that, I open it up to questions. I'm just curious, nuts and bolts. What size were those plates? I, it, the scat didn't look large enough to fill a nine inch paper plate. And yet when you wash it, you were filling plate after plate. I was curious. The, the plate is like a standard, a standard picnic big. plate. It's a big, it's a big big. plate. So it's just a small, like a, a small, small feces can produce a lot of hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's really compact and condensed in that um, as it exits the body and then the washing process, yep, it expands. <laughs> Wait, what did you? <laughs> Fluff and dry. Fluff and dry, yes. <laughs> okay, we have a question. Um, were there any sam samples of domestic or agricultural um, species found in the food or in the feces, excuse me? Were there any uh, domestic, like hair samples? Uh, of dogs or cats or cows? That were being consumed by the wolves? No, I didn't find, I didn't find, I actually didn't find any feline hair. But, but the, again, it is, it is an important point, but to look at the general location, there aren't as many operations, and this is more in cranberry country too, so, so there's not as the likelihood, but it could, there, wolves, are known to to take um, they have taken livestock before, but I didn't find find that in my research. Okay, um, were you able to identify changes in diet between early summer and late summer? That is stuff that I still need to get into. But a great question. What reference material did you use to help ID sample contents? As far as um, identifying the the hairs, the hair and there, there was a online. There's a Alaska Fur Project that I they had done some similar research, and they have man the depth that they go into onto identifying between the different species, and it, it's escaping my mind. But there's a older publication. Um, I, I would have to, if the person wanted to reach out to me, I would be able to, I would be happy to point them in the direction of, of that resource, but I'm, I'm spacing on, on the name of that reference okay. book. How, when, and where did you learn the methodology for processing the samples? <laughs> so I, I got the basic, um, I learned the basics from reading one of the papers that was done looking at the summer diets of wolves from the Voyager's Wolf Project, and then I modified the, the methods a little bit. Um, they, for, I used a full nylon stocking. They had used smaller, um, like knee highs, and I was able to fit about seven scats per, <laughs> per pair of nylons, and this was, I did this mainly as a budgetary, like this was a way to save money. So I was able to basically process seven scats for the price of one, and I got my nylon stockings from Dollar General, so it was, <laughs> I didn't go for the fancy ones. And, and another thing is that we learned, it was just trial, trial and error, but we, we used um, plastic livestock tags, which were able to be reused between different batches. So, um, and with the Voyager's Wolf Project, what I had learned is that they had pressed pennies with the ID number. And one, I didn't have the, I didn't have access to that. And two, I didn't have, it was a t matter of time efficiency. It was just, for me, it was just faster to just, um, throw in a, a colored um, ID tag into, during the washing process. <laughs> in your travels in collecting scat, did you ever come across a wolf? Two summers worth of collecting scat, I actually did not see a wolf during my time in the study area. I've seen two wolves, um, but it was during the, the winter wolf um, bioacoustics project that I participated in. It actually was on Christmas Eve, so it was kind of special. It was at night. I was driving on the road, and this was an area where wolves actually cross over frequently over this um, busier highway, and I, I saw one there. And then the other time was after the first field season in the fall, I decided I didn't have enough time in the study area, and even after collecting scat, I wanted to go back to the study site and just drive around to see what I saw, if there was any additional scat where, they were, where it was deposited, and then to just listen because um, you never know when you're going to be able to have the chance to listen to wolf, wolves howl, and that's just, that's just special. It's worth the hour and a half drive down to the study site, driving around, and then 
um, back home. So, so unfortunately, I didn't see as many wolves as I might have wanted to. But, but the uh, other things that I was able to see made up for it. I didn't actually have a picture of it, but we did see a, um, trumpeter swans in, in the area. And we did, um, Jacob and I and the dogs got to see whooping cranes and actually a whooping crane colt. So that was, that was pretty special. Any other questions from here? Sure. What am I? Is it on here? You said um, the wolf howling. Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't understand. I was thinking you meant um, Facebook Live. Like what? No. Um, I'm hoping that it'll. Yeah. So this first one. We'll try it out. Can you hear it at all? Um, <laughs> it might be broadcasting out to those viewing live, but it's not. Yeah, what? Put a link to it on. Yeah, yeah, I could. I would be happy to do that. We could play the the video or part of the video from Voyager's Wolf Project. Can, are you able to see it on, oh. Yeah, it's delayed. Oh, it's delayed on your, oh, okay. Here it is. Is it playing now? Yep. Okay. As it mentions, the wolf's beard needed a bit of a trim. <laughs> Chewing on a leg bone of a deer. So it's just kind of neat to be able to see what wolves are seeing. <laughs> but we can definitely share the, the link um, with the Winchester Academy Facebook page. But that's just a glimpse, and actually the, the wolf catches some <laughs> fish at a river, so it's, it's kind of neat. So I'll pause that. Were there any other, um, were there any other yeah. questions? I was just gonna pull up the timber wolf information um, their website, Twins website, and this is where you can go to if you're interested in attending a wolf ecology workshop or, you know, follow on Facebook for updates. There were some neat, um, neat photos are published from trail camera images. They had a black wolf that was captured on a trail camera. And we have another question. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. The question is, how in the world do blueberries go through a wolf and they still come out whole? <laughs> Even after power washer and washing machine, does the animal get any nutrition out of them? I, I would have to think that they're not getting a whole lot of nutrition from them. It's mainly filling their belly. And that, uh, with the Voyager's National, um, Voyager's Wolf Project, it was when their main source of food with the fawns drop down that they had to find some way to eat something um, and blueberries was their their calling but I didn't because I only found a couple of samples that had blueberries there the the study site that I was the central part that I was working in didn't have that type of big blueberry production um, and so that's why it wasn't a significant amount of blueberries that were produced on the landscape in order to 
um, maybe fill in the gaps. So it will be interesting to see maybe maybe since they didn't have to fill in the gaps with blueberry, blueberries similar to Voyager's wolf project, maybe that's where the you know the muskrats and the beaver are beaver are coming into play. But it, again, I can't say for sure. But that's that'll all be um, that'll all come to light as I dig deeper into research. <laughs> dig deeper, yeah. like yeah, literally. <laughs> There are a, a number of factors that could be influencing that. I did just point out one that I felt like, but but I did notice. I mean, when it gets wet down there, it gets wet, and um, the first the first season was a very wet year, and a number of the roads had a lot of standing water on them. So. I had to drive through big puddles and just cross my fingers that I didn't get stuck in the areas where the whole area is without cellular reception. So a lone woman with two dogs <laughs> getting stuck in, in water. But, but yeah, it, it would be really interesting to maybe look at maybe the difference between the, the wetness of the years. But um, the only thing that stood out to me really as being different was just the activity between with driving, and there was a lot of actual change with logging activity too. So just heavy, there was some heavy machinery um, for management purposes. But okay, no questions, but I have a couple of comments. Okay, thank you for the demonstration of the patience, precision, and perseverance needed to do research. And the next one is very informative and well presented. Well, well thank you very much. Appreciate it.